Hi everybody, and welcome back to Lecture 5, Technology Scaling. We'll now go to the third part of our lecture. We started with Moore's Law, then went over our scaling models, and now we're at the point where we start to talk about the nanoscale transistor, reminding ourselves and introducing some new secondary effects and how we solve them. So, we've had at least 50 years of scaling, and 50 years of, years of scaling equals 50 years of headaches. So the question is, how did brilliant process engineers deal with all the problems introduced by pushing physics to the limit? Let's remember some of the phenomena introduced by technology scaling and see how they've temporarily, at least, been solved. Okay, so I've divided this into several categories of problems, and I'm going to remind us of the problem, um, what causes the problem briefly, and then discuss some of the solutions that have been taken. So my first category I call mobility degradation. And we have degra uh, degraded mobility due to velocity, saturation, surface scattering, and in general, we just want more speed. So we want to have as much mobility as possible because that gives us more speed and makes our digital circuits work faster. There are a number of solutions that have currently been used or are being developed, such as strain silicon Miller indexes and using different channel materials, which we'll discuss now. Different things have been taken uh, as well, and we'll discuss a bit about current and future trends afterwards. So the first problem um, in uh, mobility degradation that I want to just remind us of or talk about is surface scattering. So when we look at the mobility, we see that it's actually dependent on the vertical field, the gate voltage, VG. In fact, we can show mobility, uh, uh, as we can see over here, that mobility is proportional to some sort of a basic mobility, this mu zero here, um, divided by one plus some sort of um, uh, theta times VGS minus VT. So we see that as we increase the, the vertical field, our mobility goes down. And why is that? Well, it's uh, pretty clear. The stronger the field, the more carriers hit the interface and scatter. So we have these, um, f uh, these field lines, uh, this field that's pushing down from the gate, and that means it's pulling the electrons that are trying to run ballistically across the, uh, the channel. So sometimes they hit this interface between the silicon and, uh, and the silicon dioxide or the, the gate oxide, and when they hit that interface, it makes them scatter or it makes them go slower and take a longer path. And that reduces our mobility, our effective uh, speed that we go through. So the basic solution that's been used and has been become very popular is called strain silicon. Okay, so basically when we have a uh, channel uh, that's made out of some sort of a, uh, a crystal in this type, uh, a single crystal silicon, it has this uh, lattice, uh, this lattice, and there are different sizes of lattices. So just as a kind of a, a schematic graphic, we have a square lattice here, and you see that these are very regular, these are nice squares, but they have some sort of a, a, a width over here. Uh, another material also is some sort of single crystal, and it has a different lattice. Well, when we put them together next to each other, what happens is that they have to join up and the different the, at the interface, the lattices have to, to meet each other. So that puts strain. It either causes com uh, compression or, um, or stress on, the, on one of the lattices, and it changes basically the size of the, uh, the, the, the lattice. Um, the, the lattice regularity over here on uh, the interface. And one of the thing, one of the side effects of that is it changes the mobility. And we can see here that when strain is applied, we get different mobilities. And in fact, it's, it's worked very well. It's worked much better for PMOSs, in fact, than NMOSs, where we actually put different types of uh, strain. So NMOSs will put tension, and, and PMOSs will put compression. And there are different ways of actually engineering the channel so it has more or less and different types of strain on it. And it's been very successful to the point where Nowadays, uh, uh, a lot of times PMOSs are the same um, speed as NMOSs versus what we used to know that NMOSs were about three times as fast as PMOSs. And that's, a lot of that's due to the very successful strain that's been able to be put on PMOSs. Okay, another solution to the mobility problem is improving the channel materials. So if we take a type of a table over here that looks at um, silicon, gallium arsenide, indium arsenide, and different types of, uh, uh, of materials, we see that the, the mobility of both electrons and holes is different in different types of materials. So um, instead of just using silicon, which is over here, why don't we try to change the channel material so it would be something else? Uh, look, here we get the 30,000 versus the 300 uh, in silicon. 
silicon. And for, for PMOSs, maybe we should use germanium, which has 1900 here. So if we were able to go and change the actual channel material, we would be able to get uh, a much higher mobility. And that's something that's been played around with and um, has been tried. There are many papers and different studies that show how to really engineer our channel with all kinds of different materials and so forth to get really nice uh, operation. And another thing that's just worth looking at, um, I'm not sure how much is used, is uh, the silicon orientation. So we know that there's a Miller index, which is the direction basically that the silicon is cut, and a silicon wafer is usually cut at direction 100. Zero, zero. But um, actually, if you look at it, you can cut the silicon differently, and by changing the orientation of the cut, both PMOSs and NMOSs for different Miller indexes get different, um, different mobilities. So it has also been played around with that we could just try to give a different orientation at the channel to improve the mobility. So that was our first um, category, and that was mobility degradation. Um, but let's go over the second one we call serial resistance. Okay, so we never actually discussed this up till now, but of course the source and drain areas, they have some resistance. So we always usually look at the channel over here, but getting to the channel from whatever, uh, whatever um, conductor there is and getting away from the channel, that's the source uh, resistance and drain resistance, they're uh, really not negligible. In fact, they have a, a large impact that could be 15% or even more on the transistor conductance. If we look at this type of sch schematic, we see that there are a lot of parts of this uh, type of resistance. So the contact has resistance which can be substantial the silicide which we'll discuss in a moment has some resistance which is pretty low the interface between the silicide and the uh, and the, the semiconductor has some resistance and then there's some serial resistance inside the um, the semiconductor over here and the lightly doped drain also has resistance which is can be substantial as well okay so in fact we should rewrite our models instead of just being uh, what our regular saturation uh, current was we have to have it have some sort of part of uh, the satur of the uh, serial resistance inside um, and as uh, uh, our VD sat as well so we have to take this into account when we're um, checking the current that actually is running through our uh, transistor so the first solution, um, as I mentioned before, is uh, what we call a silicide or a salicide. A salicide is actually a word that is uh, made up to um, show what's called a self-aligned silicide. So basically, we have a low-resistant contact that's formed on the diffusion in the poly, poly silicon surface through annealing. So we uh, make our transistor, we deposit metal, we etch away uh, this uh, uh, area um, on top of the... Uh, on top of the source drain and the poly, and then uh, we uh, do some uh, some annealing that which makes this, uh, this salicidation basically self-aligned. And this salicide, which we can see over here, um, it makes our uh, this whole part. It makes our both our poly and our diffusions have a much lower resistivity. Okay, um, the next uh, problem that we want to discuss is the hot carrier effects. So just as a reminder, when we have a strong electric field, for example, in the diffusion um, in the diffusion region, in the depletion region of the drain, usually wh what happens is when an electron arrives over here, it gets sucked in this um, field until it gets to the drain itself, and it, it gets a lot of energy. It's in the, in, in a high field. It gets a lot of energy. At the same time, we have these uh, vertical fields pulling from the gate, and often the energy gets so high that uh, these electrons can jump in, um, to, towards the gate and get stuck in all kinds of traps inside the oxide itself. Okay, so the problem is if we get charge that is stuck, in, that it jumps over the energy barrier and gets stuck in the oxide, it changes the QI, the QOx, I mean, that we had in our, in our VT um, uh, formula, and that means it changes VT over time. It's actually a reliability problem, an aging problem. Um, it happens mainly close to the drain, but it, it changes the operation of our product over time. Okay, so the solution to this is actually what we already showed, which is an LDD, a lightly doped drain. So basically, the strength of the field that we have in our depletion region is caused because we have this N plus material over here, which is very strong, and it's required actually for a good ohmic contact um, to the, the, the contact over here. Um, but 
what we do is we put this lightly doped drain, which is some N minus, and that way the depletion region over here is much smaller. It has a much smaller field, and then the energy that uh, the electrons get over inside this area is much lower, and there's much lower chance or probability of uh, electrons jumping over the energy barrier into the oxide. Okay, the next category is what we call subthreshold leakage. So subthreshold leakage is a huge problem. In fact, it's become one of the major problems in CMOS over the, the last uh, several technology generations, maybe from 90 nanometers and down. Okay, and uh, remember that the problem is that there's a finite number of free carriers in the channel when VGS is smaller than VT. So we wanted actually the, uh, the subthreshold, the, the current to be zero from the uh, source to the drain when um, VGS was smaller than VT, but it is not because we have these free carriers. Um, one of the ways of looking at it is that there's this uh, body to channel cap um, that limits the control over the channel. So again, we have our uh, T aux, which is over here, right? Our C aux, I mean. Um, if this is G and this is the channel itself, but we actually have other uh, capacitances such as the, the body. So um, this we called it C depth before, and that um, bothers our control from the, the gate to the channel. So we want to make the C depth as small as possible. There are other capacitive uh, parts here, like uh, the, the capacitance to the drain and the source, but we'll just uh, look at the C depth for right now. Okay, and we also saw that roll off or short channel effect and dibble cause an exponential current increase. So these are all problems that cause a subthreshold leakage. So there are many solutions and we'll go over uh, a bunch of them over in the next few slides. So the first solution we call MT CMOS or multi-threshold CMOS. Okay, a lot of people don't actually call it multi-threshold CMOS, but that's the uh, academic name of this. It's uh, been common and it's been found in PDKs for quite a long time. And uh, it's when we uh, supply several types of devices where each device has a different threshold voltage. So usually we use the names like HVT, which is a high VT device, okay? Uh, LVT for a low VT device, and then a, a regular device may just not have a name or it may be called a nominal VT, standard VT, regular VT, such as NVT, SVT, RVT. Anyway, these are different types of transistors that will be in our PDK. We can choose them. We have models for them. There may be more, like a super high VT or a super low VT and so forth. So we may have five, six, or more uh, types of transistors of uh, each PMOS and NMOS. Um, the higher v the VT is, the slower the devices are, but then again, they have lower leakage. The, the uh, smaller the VT, the faster the transistors are, but they tend to be very leaky, sometimes orders of magnitude to higher leakage than the, the high VT or the standard VT transistors. Um, but this actually provides us an easy way to trade off high performance and low leakage. In fact, uh, standard cell libraries, which I teach about in my digital um, VLSI design course, um, they usually have identical footprints, though one, uh, one gate will be made with high VT transistors, one with normal, and one with low VT, and then we can just flip and uh, swap out um, the different uh, flavors of these gates to uh, just in case we have extra slack on our timing pass we can put a high VT or if we have a negative slack we can put a low VT trying to meet our timing constraints. So that's a very common solution. A uh, solution that was, used to be very common in academia was body biasing. And um, we've discussed this in previous courses. So the body voltage of the transistor affects the threshold voltage. We saw that there is a uh, VSB type of a part of the formula for threshold voltage. Um, we can actually play with this in PMOS devices because we have an N well and we can tap the N well with whatever at whatever voltage we want. We don't have to keep it at VDD. We don't need any special process steps for that. We can use a deep N well, as I showed previously, with an isolated P well inside, and then also um, control the the body voltage of an NMOS transistor. Okay. However, the effectiveness the effectiveness of body biasing is thoroughly degraded with process scaling, so now it has almost no effect. Um, new technologies such as fully depleted ultra thin body and buried oxide silicon and insulator or that was a bit hard to say FDSOI that's what we usually call it or UTBB SOI um, that's the same thing they've given this technique new life and I'll show you why 
Okay, so uh, this uh, type of FDSOI is a, if this is a standard uh, transistor where we have the source and the drain inside the substrate, okay, um, and when we tap over here the body, we can put a different voltage over here, as I said, and we'll see actually um, in a minute one of the reasons why, but we don't have much uh, effect on the threshold voltage. On the other hand, with uh, fully depleted F uh, SOI, we have, uh, it's silicon and insulator, so we have this silicon um, area where the where the source drain and the channel are set. It's ultra thin, so it's an ultra thin body. Um, underneath it, we have this buried oxide layer. Um, so the buried oxide layer we also call a box. And underneath that, we have the, the silicon wafer. So what we can do actually is put a uh, bias on the, the uh, silicon that's underneath the box. And this can be either an N well or a P well. We can change the voltage of it, and that will actually really um, uh, enhance the uh, the it will change it will modify the VT of the transistor over here plus since we don't have any diodes we don't have any of these problems where we're going to actually forward body a, a diode or, or something so we have a larger range of the forward and reverse body biasing we can play and you can see how this affects VT in this graph there are different types of um, these types of transistors we can make some are car um, RVT and some are LVT and it changes if we can more efficiently do reverse or forward body biasing anyway it gives us this uh, other type of a knob that we can play with and in, in an FDSOI process we can actually change VT based on how we um, how we uh, bias the, 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 the body okay you can see here a, uh, a, a, a microscopic picture of how it lo looks Okay, and uh, another solution for subthreshold leakage is what we call vertical dimensions. So um, one of the models of VT will show us how we take into effect the vertical dimensions of VT. So uh, the VT is basically the, the VT of the long transistor, but then we have the things such as dibble, roll off, and, uh, and other things that affect it. So one of the models that is shown by Chen Mingu is that we can say VT long minus this VDS, which is basically due to dibble, plus uh, this factor 0.4 times e to the power of the L, which is the length of the transistor, divided by this parameter that's called LD, where uh, for, in a, for a given uh, technology, L has to be at least four times the size of LD to actually continue to scale. So what is this LD? LD is the th third square root of the T ox, W dep, and XJ, where of course T ox is the gate thickness, W dep is the depletion width under the channel, and XJ is the, uh, the source or drain junction depth. Okay, so um, if we look at that and we take a, one of our transistors over here, okay, so we know that um, this guy over here is our T ox, so that's a vertical dimension. Okay, W dep is actually the depth of the uh, depletion region underneath the channel over here, so that W depth, and that's also vertical, and XJ is actually the uh, size of this, um, this uh, uh, junction. So all of these are vertical dimensions, and what we can see here is that we want to make this as small as possible to remove all of these short channel effects. Um, from from our uh, VT model, okay. So the the point is that we want to make all of these small. So uh, the, the smaller we can make it, the smaller we can make the minimum L. And um, of course, if we just look specifically, T ox a smaller T ox means we get better transconductance, as we know. Um, a smaller XJ, this guy over here, means we get lower uh, source and drain capacitance, and a smaller W dep means we get better drain channel isolation. Um, there are several other factors that are good about these these three things too. Okay, so how are we going to deal with them? Well, the first thing, and we already discussed it a bit before, is that thinner oxide is a really important aspect of ch is scaling. The, the smaller the oxide, or the thinner the oxide, the better gate control we get. C ox gets larger, we get better transconductance. Everything's good about making an oxide thin, except for the fact that it causes gate leakage. So you see that over the years, we have scaled this um, oxide thickness until, as we mentioned, uh, we got to a minimum, and we'll discuss that in a little bit uh, in more detail. Okay, the, the, the next part, the XJ, is the shallow junctions. Um, so we want shallow junctions, but and they're achieved by um, different ways. We can have high substrate doping. High substrate doping is not uh, something we want too much because then it'll be harder to turn on the transistor. It'll be harder to deplete the channel. Okay, um, 
Lightly doped drains, LDDs are one way of get, uh, getting shorter channels and we use LDDs. And metal source drains, this is something that would really have less depletion, but it causes a shot key diode and so we probably wouldn't want to use it. Um, there are other things like raised source and drain and so forth that are used. Um, but one of the other uh, things that I want to discuss is this W depth, this, uh, the, uh, the um, depth of the depletion layer under the channel. So one of the things that's done is what's called retrograde doping. So we can see here this uh, doping profile of a, a regular transistor or an old time transistor. And this is how far deep down into the silicon we get from the channel interface, okay, the, uh, from where we, we interface with the TOX. And you see that it's pretty standard. I mean, it does get higher as we go down, but not that big a, a difference um, versus a retrograde doping, which is used in, in most cases nowadays, where right at the channel interface, we have a very low doping level and that means we can deplete our channel really fast turn on and off our transistor very fast but we have this steep um, uh, slope over here and soon when we get down a little bit deeper into the body we have a very high uh, doping level which is, is good for many reasons for example it can help uh, reduce punch through um, it, it helps us really in many ways one of the things uh, that, that it does it means that the the W depth now doesn't vary that much with the change in VSB and that's good it, it basically cancels out the body effect okay it makes the body effect in modern devices um, very limited Limited, and that's something that it's wanted. Uh, usually body effect is, is not considered a design parameter, but rather a parasitic effect. So um, this is a type of thing that helps get rid of it. Um, one of the things is that the body effect also becomes similar to what we can see here in this graph. It becomes linear versus whatever it was before, um, uh, the, the shape it was, which wasn't exactly linear. Anyway, um, and it also reduces punch through, as I said, because we have a high dopant level underneath the, the gate. We'll discuss that a bit later in this part of, uh, of the lecture, what, how we reduce punch through. Um, Anyway, so that's something that's done today, but it also makes the fact that uh, the uh, body effect uh, is almost non-existent in, in uh, advanced processes, and especially FinFETs. Okay, so uh, another solution, maybe the last solution that I'm going to discuss in this part, is what we call multi-gate transistors. Okay, and this was a, a big step, actually, in uh, the development of of, uh, of of, te of process technology. Okay, so the idea was if, if we want to have uh, our um, C aux be much bigger than our C dep, right? We want the C aux to be much bigger than our C dep. Well, let's try to add more of these capacitors in, in uh, parallel or whatever, and then we have the lumping of them is better. So let's put a double gate transistor. We'll have two gates, and each gate will have its own C aux. It'll be C aux 1 and C aux 2, or something like that. These are shorted together, and then we get much better um, uh, channel control. Um, so that was something that was tried out and shown, never brought to uh, production quality. But in 2011, Intel was able to come out with the first production quality FinFET, or they call it a tri-gate transistor, which is a similar idea to the, uh, the uh, double gate but now we have the gate on the left, the gate on the right, and they're connected uh, over the top. So basically the way this works is we build a fin, we build a raised source and drain, and these are these very thin pieces of, uh, of uh, silicon that are on top of the, uh, on top of the, the substrate, and they run um, on, on the whole wafer very regularly so we can make them really close together and it's a very small feature size. Then we take polysilicon, as you can see, and we go the other way, and it climbs over these fins, and what is created are these uh, trigate or these fin-fit transistors. So we have the source and drain here. This is where our uh, current is flowing, and the uh, we put a voltage on the gate, and we get all these um, uh, capacitors or these field uh, these fields that uh, control the gate from three sides. Okay, so you can see a picture of it over here. You have the raised source and the raised drain, and you have the fin, that, uh, the gate that goes over this fin and controls the uh, channel, which is right underneath there. Okay, there are actually many types of multi-gate transistors. They've been, uh, I'll talk about it in the current and future trends. There are some more that have been coming up in recent years. But here's kind of an overview of different types of um, options that you have here. Um, you try to get more and more control over the channel. So you go from this FinFET type of a thing we have here to maybe what we call like a, a, an omega gate 
Okay, so you see that this thing kind of looks like the letter omega, so it has even more um, around it. And then we go into something like called a gate all around, a horizontal gate all around. So here we have on four sides the gate. We have really all the uh, fields from every single side. So that's a gate all around type of thing. There's also the option of going vertical where we would have our uh, source and drain going vertical and our gates are like these donuts around and you can put several of them on top of each other as well. So that's a vertical gate all around nano wire MOSFET. MOSFET. Um, there are different types of these. Uh, often the gate all arounds nowadays are called nano sheets. They'll be um, these sheets that are inside uh, the poly uh, and then you have these are each these sheets, and each of them is a gate all around controlled. Okay, um, so the last thing is an alternative to FinFET, and it could be complementary, and it's called silicon on insulator or SOI. Um, we discussed it, we showed it before, but silicon on insulator didn't start actually with the fully depleted silicon on insulator, the fully depleted SOI. That's uh, the current uh, trend of it, um, and it's used in some processes. Uh, down currently to 22 nanometers. Uh, it's a better uh, way to make transistors possibly, or at least some people think so. So again, what we do is basically we put a thin body and we have, uh, where, so the transistor's over here, so we have the uh, source and the drain and they're fully depleted, which means that uh, when uh, that their depletion layer reaches this uh, um, silicon dioxide, this buried ox, this box layer, and it can't continue, it can't, poke down anymore it's stopped by this uh, by this uh, box layer so it's fully depleted these uh, source and drain are fully depleted this is the channel and underneath we have the substrate or the well which we can bias so it means that our depletion widths are fixed w depth can't go down any further we wanted to make w depth small xj can't go down any further we wanted to make xj small so uh, we we help that it helps lower the roll off and dibble um, effects um, there's no punch through so punch through usually goes and has the source and drain depletion layers connect somewhere deep inside the body well that doesn't happen because we have this SiO2 layer okay the junction to substrate capacitances are are small in this case okay and we don't have any latch up because we don't have these parasitic uh, BJTs and so forth so they're really these this type of silicon and insulator technology is really good for um, high radiation environments like space or like airplanes and so forth okay um, and they also often use these raised source and drains uh, to reduce the resistivity in this type of uh, technology. Okay, our next um, problem is the problem of gate leakage. Okay, and just a reminder that uh, in uh, gate leakage, what we have is that uh, the electrons can actually jump over the barrier between the, so the, between the gate and uh, the substrate or in the channel. And it's ex exponentially dependent basically on the thickness of the, the, the oxide. So the smaller T ox get, the more of a chance that we're going to have this tunneling through it. A thin uh, oxide reduces roll off, a thin oxide pro uh, provides higher transconductance, and a thi thin oxide reduces the subthreshold swing, as you remember. N is 1 plus C dep over C oxy. And, uh, uh, the lower T ox get, the higher C ox gets. So again, we want to have a thin oxide, but the problem is that the thinner we make the oxide, the uh, more gate leakage we have. Okay, the major problem is that at some point around 65 nanometers, oxide thickness reached 1.2 nanometers. That was five atomic layers. So you had five atoms in here. One, two, three, four, five. That was it, five atoms. So it was pretty easy for electrons to just jump over here. We had a lot of gate leakage. Gate leakage was on the order of subthreshold leakage, and we couldn't make it any smaller. So basically, there was a kind of a decision. Can't go under one and a half nanometers. We have to find something um, uh, to do to solve it. Maybe scaling has ended at this point. Well, this was quite a long time ago, and luckily um, the researchers were able to come out with what is known as high K dielectrics. So higher K, and when we say K, we mean transconductance, and K, remember, is uh, mu C ox, and C ox is um, the permittivity epsilon ox divided by T ox. So high K is basically a high permittivity of the uh, gate dielectric. So the epsilon uh, ox gets bigger. If we get uh, higher epsilon ox, C ox is increased, and that's really good. Okay, It means that we get higher transconductance. Right, Higher transconductance means more speed. That's what we want. Okay, We get a uh, better um, subthreshold swing, so we get better gate control. Um, and that means that 
in fact, we're not going to just be too greedy and take this uh, boost in transconductance and keep our one and a half nanometer thick um, oxide. We're going to actually keep a similar transconductance, but make the gate oxide much thicker, thereby reducing the, sub uh, the gate leakage. So what was happened was we used thicker gates to eliminate tunneling without losing control or, uh, or drive strength. And then we can continue scaling. And it gave us a, a, about a 10x boost in the size of our gate oxides from this one and a half nanometers to maybe 15 nanometers and gave us a few more generations of, uh, of, um, of gate oxide thickness reduction. Okay, so uh, high K dielectrics are basically built on hafnium oxide. Each fab has their own secret sauce, but um, it's something like that with a, a constant of about 24, which is about six times larger than that of uh, silicon dioxide. Okay, so um, that's a, a good solution. Um, furthermore, remember we had this uh, parameter we called T oxy, which was the electro or the effective or electrical oxide thickness, which had these problems of uh, both channel depth and polysilicon depletion. Well, instead of having polysilicon depletion, we went over to a metal gate uh, technology. So usually we call high um, when we use high K, we usually call it HKMG. Uh, which means high K metal gate. So nowadays, usually a metal gate is used. So back to the days of the MOS, we really do have MOS. I guess this isn't really an oxide, but uh, M high K S uh, versus having polysilicon as the metal gate. Um, of course, the metal gate is also better in uh, terms of conduction. All right, so that took a long time to, to make, but eventually we were able to replace the uh, oxide over here with, with this high K material. One of the uh, kind of um, uh, strange things or ironic things about this is one of the big successes of the MOS technology was that it was easy to grow this very perfect uh, oxide barrier on top of silicon, and now we're actually not using oxide on top of the silicon. But, um, MOS technology is so advanced and uh, so sophisticated that it, it, they've been able to find ways around this. Okay, the next problem that we wanted to discuss is punch-through currents. And just a reminder what punch-through cur currents are. The drain and the source depletion regions connect to each other deep underneath the channel. So basically, we have this uh, depletion region. We have this depletion region. Often, we put some sort of a VDD here. When we put VDD, this gets really big. And if our uh, L is small enough, right, then this is going to connect with this. And we're just going to have free, um, free current down through way underneath the uh, the uh, the channel, um, not controlled by our gate, and that means we don't have transistors. So some solutions are halo implants, LDD, retrograde doping, and SOI. We've already discussed both retrograde doping and SOI, so retrograde doping means we had a high degree of doping way under here inside the channel that reduces the de these depletion layers. Um, LDDs we've also discussed, so the LDDs over here and over here, they have smaller depletion regions. Okay, so there's less of a chance of, uh, of uh, punch through. And SOI, we said that here we have a buried oxide, and then um, basically these deep depletion region uh, uh, are not going to occur at all. Okay, but one of the solutions that's used even from around 180 nanometers is called halo implants, so, uh, or they're also called pocket implants. Okay, so what halo implants are is basically um, we take uh, boron implants and we give them an angle. So we shoot them in with uh, the, an angle and they go deep inside the silicon and get stuck over here. So here's the, uh, the, the drain and we, get, um, we build these implants of boron over here. Okay, and this is a... a, a and you can see over here these pockets and what they do is they suppress the depletion region of the drain so we get these um, p-type implants that we stick over here and over here and they really fight against the depletion of the source in the drain however they do something else they also cause a uh, rise basically in the implant implant level uh, or effective implant level we have over here and that means it takes more uh, voltage on it takes more voltage on the gate in order to deplete uh, the this uh, uh, essentially um, higher effective um, doping over here and it makes us have a, a higher VT so the interesting thing is is that as we saw before when we take the L down we go down far enough we usually had this roll off but due to this effect where we actually add these 
pluses inside here, which makes the, the amount of charge we have to deplete over here higher. It makes a VT rise at a certain point over here with some sort of a uh, L, which is usually close to an L minimum. And this we call the reverse short channel effect. Okay, finally, our last problem that we're going to discuss in this section of the lecture is latch up. Okay, so just as a reminder, we discussed this, um, that we have a thyristor that's created because of a voltage drop over the substrate over the well, and um, that this thyristor, it's this type of uh, positive feedback, and it's going to go into this infinite loop, which is going to burn out our chip in the end. Um, but also, any case of forward bias diodes in our chip, we're going to call that latch up. So usually, there are two ways to get rid of latch up. Um, one of them is using SOI. SOI doesn't have latch up. It's really nice. But the standard way in bulk CMOS is to use body taps. So we sh showed how to make body taps here in an N well. We're going to put N type uh, body tap in a P well. We're going to put a P type body tap. We're going to connect the N to VDD. We're going to connect the P to VSS or ground. And um, the more we put together, we're going to have lower resistance between different parts of the body. And then there's less of a chance that we're going to turn on these uh, parasitic uh, BGTs and create this type of thyristor feedback. Okay, so that's how we solve latch up. Um, so those were different secondary effects that we have in the nanoscale transistor and uh, the way that we solve them. And with that, we can go on to the next section, which will be about current and future trends.